Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Simon Rosenberg from Indiana, the New Policy Institute. Uh, we're grateful for you all uh, being here today, and for those of you who are watching online, either live or at some future date, we're uh, grateful for your participation. Um, this is an interesting event. I mean, this is not a subject that we're going to that is the subject we're going to be talking about today is not one that Indiana has a long history of being engaged with. But I'm a, an American. I'm a consumer. I'm a, a guy who uses the post office every day. <laughs> I had this experience yesterday that I this, this crazy fortuitous um, experience yesterday that I just want to start with today, which is that at 8:30 yesterday morning, uh, I have three young kids at home and we do most of our shopping on Amazon Prime, and so we get packages, you know, two or three times a week, and it's sort of like candy. We now have to. My wife's name is on every package, but my kids always open them up, no matter who it's uh, addressed to. And it's a little, it's a little bit of. We have a management issue uh, at our house uh, of how the packages come come in. But um, yesterday morning, eight thirty, doorbell rang, Sunday morning, and uh, I went and answered the door, and it was a, a letter carrier dropping off an Amazon Prime package at eight thirty on Sunday morning, and I was shocked, right? And I opened the door and I. I knew I was doing this event today, and I said, so 8.30 in the morning on a Sunday, what are you doing here? And he said, look, Amazon's big business for us here as letter carriers. He said, we love to deliver your stuff. You can work with us. But he said, Sunday mornings are okay. And I tell that story just in part to start today because of how personal, part of the reason I think this has become an issue that the country's talking about, it's just, you know, Saturday delivery, is that the experience of the Postal Service is so personal to all of us, right? It's something that is an intrinsic part of our life. It's the arguably the oldest and most profound economic thing undergirding our American economy. It started all the way back in the 18th century, right? And, it, and so what happens to it, I think, matters not just for our economy, but our sense of, of who we are and you know, what kind of country we're going to become. And I can tell you that as a dad who lives in a residential neighborhood in Northwest D.C., the comfort that I have of knowing that these folks in these trucks are walking around my neighborhood uh, every day is an, uh, an, an additional layer of security uh, that I feel, in addition to getting good stuff like presents in the mail every day, right, and packages, that this is, you know, this is important to me. I mean, it's really, so part of the reason we're doing this event today is that, in, and also I have a brother who worked with a, at the front of a window in a post office in Wilton, Connecticut for 20 years and spent, um, you know, and enjoyed it every day that he was there uh, at the window. He didn't like being in the back so much, but he liked uh, being in the window. So the second thing is the reason we decided to do this event is that we've done a lot of thinking over the years around the concept of networks and the way that networks, functioning networks, provide value and opportunity in the American economy. We've written a path-breaking paper on the need to remake the electricity grid in the United States, sort of moving beyond a 100-year-old regulatory scheme that is not allowing the level of innovation required in the, in, in the economy that we need today. We've you know, been among the leading thinkers about the import of the global communications network. I mean, our first major paper about the rising power of, the, of mobile was in 2006. Alec Ross and I, a guy that is well known to anyone who sort of follows the internet space, he and I wrote a paper together in 2007 calling for the concept that we all know today of internet freedom. Um, first time it had really been articulated by a major American think tank. And it was predicated on this idea that there was this global network being established of communications that, that, we, that was providing more opportunity for freedom of thought and freedom of the exchange of information than ever before, right? Uh, we've also written, we were the, probably the first think tank in DC to support the infrastructure, the idea of an infrastructure bank, something that's being implemented now. And Chicago, which was a, another tool to help improve the transportation network, right, that so much of our economy is built on. And so when I started reading about this proposal that's here, right, which is you can get a copy on our website, this really fit into a lot of the things that we've been talking about here for a long time, about something, though, that is I hadn't really thought about very much in the way that I think about other issues at a think tank, right, with the same kind of strategic intent, thoughtfulness. And I think that the before I introduce our, our, our two guests, I just want to say that, you know, this is this is what think tanks are supposed to do, right? I think this is a really interesting idea. It's not a, it's not a piece of legislation. It's not fully fleshed out yet. 
it's in, we're in the early stages, but certainly I think all of us want a thriving, functioning post postal service for the 21st century. We all know that there's already been a great degree of public-private partnership, more so than I think most people actually understand that's been existing in the postal network, if you want to call it that, as opposed to the postal service. And that we better be innovative and smart, I think, in, in order to save the, po the postal service and make sure it's everything we want it to be in the 21st century. So we're lucky that a paper has come along laying out one, I think, compelling idea. Uh, we happen to have two of the four authors with us today uh, who are going to take us through this. And, I, and it's going to be, we're going to have a conversation, right? We're going to have a conversation. And what I also admired about this paper, and one of the reasons we dove into this a little bit, is that the four authors come from all different perspectives, left and right, managing labor, right? And, and really found consensus about one idea of what could be done to, to make the post office better. So please join me in welcoming our, our two guests today, George Gould and John Nolan. Um, uh, John, I and their bios are on our website, so I'm not going to go through them in great detail, but John you know, actually helped run the post Postal Service uh, in, in a management capacity. He has a lot of experience on the private sector side of it, too. Um, and George is, uh, one of the reasons I, I did this event is that I'm of an age, and George, you won't date ourselves too much, where you know, many of my closest friends in democratic politics got their career, uh, started their career working for George. J.D. Kirsch, uh, and a whole bunch of guys who get forget their name, who are among the best people that I know in politics, who George was their mentor. And so whatever George Gould wants is something that I think I have to do as long as I, I run NDN. So it's really a great honor to have both of you here today. And uh, how are we going to start, guys? Who's going to kick it off? John, you want to take it, take it away? Yes, please turn on your, your thing so we get a little green light. And then we'll be able to go. And we're going we're gonna to hear about the paper, and then we're going to have time for lots of back and forth with all of you. And thanks for coming, everybody. Well, thank you. Um, as, as you said, um, four of us got together. Um, one common thing we had is that we feel strongly about the Postal Service and the importance of the Postal Service, and there was a lot of debate going on in, in Congress and in the industry about things that needed to be done to um, help the Postal Service financially get on a solid foundation. And uh, while all of those things that were being discussed we felt were critical and very important, we felt that there was another area that that needed to be looked at, and that uh, dealt with the whole area of uh, innovation um, in both the um, uh, control of costs, but even uh, as important or more important uh, is the uh, innovation around product development and service development, and the ability to uh, tailor products and services to customer groups that is very difficult for a, an organization like the Postal Service as purely a um, government-like entity or certainly controlled by the government. And we'd seen over and over again where the controls that were placed on the Postal Service over time uh, made it difficult to um, innovate to the degree that they might have wanted to do or uh, in their DNA there are certain things that they're, they're, they're not great at starting new products and services. It just has not been in their DNA. It's not the things that, that they specialize in. And so we, f and I, I personally have been very involved internationally uh, in watching the uh, posts around the world um, privatize and um, felt very strongly that that was not a model that, um, that was right for the United States. And so we came together and kicked around a number of different ideas about things that the, the uh, country ought to be thinking about, that the Postal Service ought to be thinking about, and the notion of this private public partnership was one that resonated with all of us coming at it from different angles. It was very interesting actually to see how we wound up uh, 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 in agreement even though we came at it from, from very different places. And uh, um, I think it was, it was very satisfying to, to feel like we could get something started that would create the kind of discussion that has begun to, to develop around this, uh, uh, this issue. But it's, um, to us, as we looked into it more and more, it wasn't um, the revolution that some people think it is when they first read it, that this, oh my gosh, this, now you're going off the deep end, uh, going the crazy stuff. The, uh, in fact, uh, the notion of 
public-private partnerships has been with the Postal Service since the early 70s. And um, we used to joke with the private, uh, with the foreign posts that the Postal Service uh, in the United States might have been more privatized than they were after they privatized uh, because of the uh, amount of involvement in the private sector in the Postal Service network um, uh, day in and day out through all parts of the, uh, the operation. So we, uh, we, we don't think it's quite as revolutionary as people think. For my time, uh, whether it was with the railroad or with the airlines or with private companies, we always had an opportunity to partner with each other. Uh, and now what we see is what similar to what we saw in the 60s uh, with the Postal Service. We see uh, in, in, in those days what was happening with the, the postal facilities were a lot of division. I'm not being critical, it is a reality. Uh, the unions in this room were opposed to the postal division. They wanted to pay those which they deserved, and they wanted separate legislation to give them comprehensive postal reform that they deserved. Uh, the chairman of the two committees, Ralph and myself, were for comprehensive postal reform that they deserved. President Johnson, uh, his, his recommendation was for a postmaster to improve them there was none, but felt that there was a necessity for comprehensive postal reform. He gave a speech to the Magazine Publishers Association, um, and I happened to attend that speech in which he suggested that the President ask his Committee of Commission to look into a comprehensive approach. Uh, when President Nixon came in, uh, they continued that effort. And what I saw toward the end of that effort was people working together literally with the union president working with the president Nixon, the postmaster general, who was avidly and audibly, may I use it, working with the president of the letter carrier to see some type of compromise. Uh, and actually lobbying together on the Hill to achieve that compromise. And eventually passed it and as a signature by the president Nixon as opposed to the organization that we have been talking about. Which I think most people now looking at it said, I'm, I'm not suggesting there is one way or the other, but what we put on paper is perfect, 
that there's no problem or shouldn't be a blessing. Uh, I'm just saying that I would not be part of anything that I thought was hurting the employees of the Credit Facility or, or hurt the service itself. I just strongly feel that the way it's going, there's going to be a negative impact on the service itself and on its employees and on its customers. And if there isn't any adjustment, it's going to continue to be additional problems for everybody that's involved. So the idea was to take the strength of the postal service and use it. And that's the way I approached it. And honestly, the way I feel about it. So what, so, yeah, go ahead. So, so what are we talking about? <coughs> Uh, basically, we looked at what is the Postal Service's core strengths, and its, its fundamental strength is delivery. Everywhere, every day, um, whether that's five days or six days or even on Sunday. Um, delivery is, is the real core strength of the Postal Service. Transportation, a lot of companies do transportation. Distribution, you look at the Amazon warehouses and a lot of the other warehouses, there's a lot of people out there doing sorting, UPS, FedEx. So sorting in itself is not a core strength of the Postal Service uh, per se. Um, so what we're talking about is the fact that we would like to see a lot of the upstream operations as we call them, the initial sorting of mail, uh, the distribution of mail, the transportation of mail to get it close to destination be opened up to the private sector. Um, and you do that by offering a delivery charge. So everyone can handle, I could go to Amazon and, and be their agent that trucks everything and, and sorts it and moves it close to destination to, for a final delivery. Uh, I could do the same thing with Merrill Lynch statements um, if, if there was a destination delivery charge. The last sort where you sort it to the carrier route and walk sequence, you couldn't have that wide open because you only have to have, you can only have one company do that. It doesn't do you any good to have seven companies handing the letter carriers seven different bundles uh, that they then have to sort into walk sequence. So that would be a, a, a more of a contracted kind of thing for the uh, uh, company handling that on the destination side. That same building that same facility would also handle the originating mail, let's say, in, from Los Angeles going to the rest of the country. But the notion is that the private sector would work with the, the, the uh, uh, industry, would work with the co uh, customers to try and innovate product and service offerings that make it more advantageous to utilize the Postal Service for everything from first class mail to advertising mail to packages to you name it. Um, as a way of growing this business. And by tailoring products and service offerings in a way that makes it exciting and usable for private companies, that the volume would increase um, uh, in the mailing industry and gets the mail to the destination where the letter carrier then can uh, affect delivery or the sortation to post office boxes or what have you. But that's the fundamental notion uh, that we're talking about here. And it is, as I said before, it's not as radical as it might seem. As George said, back in the 60s and early 70s, mail was backing up terribly in this country. It was just the start of the revolution in, in use of the mail to advertise. And the Postal Service was way behind in uh, mechanizing its operations. And so it was backlogged. Um, there was mail stuffed everywhere. And the Postal Service at the time knew that they couldn't possibly mechanize fast enough to get out of this hole. So what did they do? They introduced something called pre-sort that basically got private industry involved in sorting mail to destination, which bypassed the origin facilities, moved to destination, and automatically you eliminated a significant amount of the mail that had to be sorted, and it cleared up the backlog very quickly and enabled the Postal Service to be able to handle the tremendous growth that occurred in the mailing industry uh, in the 70s and 80s um, and uh, helped keep costs down, um, uh, improve uh, service. It, it was the right thing to do. That kind of thing is what we're talking about here in a, in a different form, taking it to the next step. The same kinds of things in public-private partnerships have occurred on the package side of the business. Uh, uh, the Postal Service delivers a lot of packages for UPS and FedEx. Uh, especially to residential areas, especially lightweight packages. 
And so there's a recognition among competitors that there's a better way than just me doing everything. Um, as, as, as a UPS employee or as a FedEx employee or as a postal employee. And so what we're talking about here is finding ways to reinvigorate the mailing industry, to save the jobs that are in the mailing industry, to improve the service and keep costs down for customers. And uh, we think the best way to go about that is to uh, take advantage of the talents uh, and unique capabilities that exist uh, with variety of different organizations, companies in this, in this country. Could the Postal Service do it on its own? Why not just get more creative, you know? Um, part of the problem is that there's a, a basic sense in this country that people don't want the Postal Service competing with private industry. And so the notion that the Postal Service ought to be allowed to get into more things. Why shouldn't the Postal Service become a warehouse? You've got a lot of companies uh, that, that want to ship products. Why couldn't the Postal Service be a warehouse connected to a processing center? People don't want the Postal Service involved in more different kinds of things. And yet, it might make perfect sense as a way for a company to make more efficient and more effective the entire distribution and delivery operation for packages in this country. The same could be said for letter mail or, or uh, magazines or, or what have you, advertising mail. So uh, part of this is a cost control idea, uh, unfettered by possible legislation that could creep into an, on any day that would keep the Postal Service from doing the things it needed to do. But part of it is around innovation in products and services. And that's an area that we think has the potential to help reinvigorate this industry. And, um, uh, and that's good news for everybody. Let me ask a couple questions before we turn it open to the, to the audience here. John, can you tell us, you know, one of the things that struck when I read the paper was that the amount of packages delivered by the Postal Service today that is from someone else, UPS, FedEx, has gone from 100 million a year to 300, close to 350 million last year. So, you know, one of the things that I've, since I've started researching this, this, the delivery I've now seen that I've gotten, <coughs> about two months ago, I got a, I got a FedEx package from the, a letter carrier. And, it, and, and I was surprised, just like you're sitting on Sunday morning. And then in researching this, I realized this is now common, right? So can you talk a little bit about how that's come about? And you know, this is a huge volume, right? We're talking hundreds of millions of packages. This relationship, this public-private hybrid that we're, we're describing is already much more developed than I think any commonly understood. Yeah, and and um, so it's increased dramatically the postal service deliveries, but UPS and FedEx have also increased dramatically. Yeah, and so it's, it's a win-win uh, really for everybody. The, the UPS and FedEx, uh, UPS especially, does not like very lightweight, small packages destined for r residential areas. They don't make much money on that. Um, and yet, a lot of their customers demand that if, if you're going to take the heavy stuff, I want you to take the light stuff too. I want you to make it easy for me. I, I'm, you know, I'm a small shipper. I, sh I ship uh, dog medication, um, and I don't want to have to deliver and worry about all that stuff. So I'm shipping in bulk, but I'm also shipping small stuff. I want you to handle it all for me, or I don't want you to handle it at all. And what? UPS and FedEx were seeing more and more was that kind of attitude on the part of shippers. And so by definition, they had to get more involved in handling everything for a lot of their customers if they were to get the business. And so what do you do when you have to deliver everything? Well, for forever, UPS has been putting packages in the Postal Service. I mean, when they first got started, there weren't many packages in Montana. And so how do you get delivered in Montana if someone gives you a Montana package? You give it to the Postal Service because they're going everywhere anyway. So that's, there's been a history of that. But now with this uh, uh, internet shopping um, and the lightweight packages, the, the one-off that you're buying, you're not buying 17 things at a time. You, you need that score pad for your baseball team uh, 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 today. And so uh, that's what you order. Uh, what, what UPS and FedEx and others uh, have found is that there's nothing 
less expensive and, and more effective for delivery of those things than the Postal Service. And so, and the Postal Service, by uh, the same token, um, has priced properly uh, this product offering to make sure that it's very interesting for competitors. And so volume has skyrocketed, and, um, uh, and that's been very, very useful for everybody. Consumer wins, and, and uh, everyone else is winning. And George, you know, one of the things I referred to in the beginning was just in thinking about how to talk about this issue. You know, all of these other networks that undergird our economy are public-private hy hybrid. The, the line has been drawn somewhere through public policy about what is done by private entities and what's done in the public sphere. And uh, whether it's the electricity networks, the transport, I'm, I now have an easy pass, which I use to drive my kids to baseball tournaments on the, you know, I, I, you know, uh, on the Beltway or I'm on a privatized road sometimes, I'm on a public road at other times, right? Uh, that we're seeing much more as in part in dealing with the rapidly changing world that we live in, the pace of change that we live in in the United States, the technology advances that are going on, that having this option of private, if you want to call it that, and it's almost the wrong term, is a, another tool in the toolbox to solve a problem in many cases. And you're seeing this play out in, in all of these other networks that, are, that undergird our economy. Isn't it true that the postal network, not the postal service, but the the network that moves packages around, letters around now, how, how do you, is there a number that is how much of that is already private? And, it's and it's yeah. considerable and it's been going on for a long time. And, 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 and as John said, they, they've been delivering <coughs> UPS packages for a long time. They've had private companies delivering them in LXP facilities in rural areas for a long time. They've had partnerships with companies that have processed the mail. Um, and, uh, and the Postal Service is doing the work of helping and working with other private companies in other aspects, uh, bringing the mail aspects up. So this is a partnership that's gone on for a long time. And, uh, and the reality is that it generally hasn't been discussed very much, and there's certainly not a discussion with the American public, so it's kind of looked like they're just two separate entities. And the reality is they've, they've co-mingled they've for a long time. When we were doing the 70 Act, one of the controversial issues was no longer allowing the uh, postal clerks to, to sort mail in regular time. Uh, so there was a partnership right there. And, and then there was a period when the Postal Service was delivering its own mail by airplane, found out that, that uh, they would turn it over to uh, airlines, but then discovered that the airlines were putting it in the back only delivering it if there wasn't enough passengers on the <laughs> plane. So then they had to, then they had to uh, 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 rework that system. Uh, so my point being that for years, for a long, long time, this has been going on. And the other area of, 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 of dynamic that's been involved is the political dynamic. And that is, frankly, members of Congress, understandably protecting their constituents, but but interfering with how the Postal Service should do its business best by restricting things that they do or promoting things that they, they need for their business. Yeah. Um, I'll give you a quick example. When, the, when we were having financial problems relative to the United States, back in the 80s, uh, uh, si similar to, to, not as quite as prosperous as today, but similar, um, the, uh, the Congress passed legislation to take money away from the Postal Service and use it to balance the budget. The same time they were doing this, a member of Congress, who's still a member of Congress, by the way, uh, served on the Appropriation Committee, Subcommittee, they had jurisdiction over the Postal Service, and on the Budget Committee. They came out of the Budget Committee meeting where they just voted to do what I referenced, walked up to me and started telling me that he would like to have a letter for you help in, in promoting the postal management to build a new postal facility in Washington. Now they had just taken money away from the <laughs> Postal Service to balance their budget, but at the same time he wanted the Postal Service to put up a new facility. And the reality was he didn't see the connection. I'll, sure. I'll give, there are eight million jobs in this country involved in some way in the mailing industry. Truck drivers, 
paper manufacturers, envelope manufacturers. There's 500,000 people in the Postal Service. So when you look at the, the scope of the industry and how much is Postal Service right now, Postal Service, it seems strange to say this, is small. Mm -hmm. uh, Postal Service is what, 60 some odd billion dollars um, uh, in revenue. The mailing industry in this country is over a trillion dollars, 7% of the gross national product. Um, again, we're counting paper manufacturing, um, uh, transportation, et cetera. So there's a lot at stake here outside the Postal Service. There's a lot of jobs at stake. There are union jobs. There are non-union jobs. There are, there, there are, it's everything. And um, a lot of, every piece of first class mail, other than from mom and pop, all the pre-sorted mail, at least one handling has been eliminated from the uh, Postal Service <coughs> through pre-sort. And that's decades ago. Advertising mail. Almost nothing goes end to end. It all bypasses the origin facility and moves to destination. Happened decades ago. So there's a logic to why that happened. Some of the sorting that's taking place isn't actually physical sorting. It's done on computer. So it was more efficient to take it away from the Postal Service to enable rates to stay low, which help volume grow. Uh, so when pre-sort started in the 70s, postal employment was nowhere near what it grew to 20 years later, despite the fact that they were handling percentage-wise less of the total amount of mail um, number of handlings. So handling less grew jobs because the Postal Service was more cost-effective, the Postal Service had better service as a result of all that. That, to me, is still possible today. Well, it certainly seems, we'll open it up, it certainly seems that, you know, if assuming that my family is a canary in the coal mine, you know, that an enormous percentage of our, uh, of what we buy now, we're even buying our dog food on Amazon Prime, we're buying, you know, we're buying food now, uh, you know, that you can get gratuitously because we're, you know, if you're an Amazon Prime and I'm an Amazon, I have no connection to Amazon, <laughs> I'm just a hugely happy customer, but Amazon Prime, 70 bucks a year, no shipping costs, and so what happens is that, you know, my dog, my puppy, uh, gets his monthly allocation of dog food through, you know, two day, no cost delivery. And it's a big bag, it's a 25 pound bag, right? And, you know, that means we don't have to go to PetSmart and find a parking space and, you know, everything else. And so the efficiency for busy families in the modern world of moving some percentage of your retail shopping, if it becomes more efficient, if you can track it, if it's regular. And what's great is that I go to Amazon and the dog food's already there. I just pull it up. I hit a button, and boom, it's here two days you later. You let the dog know that the letter carrier is delivering it? <laughs> the letter carrier. So he won't so you don't bite, bite, bite carrier. <laughs> my my right. puppy likes the letter carrier. Exactly. We'll see what happens when he's full grown. But So part of it is that I assume that as we get, as digital natives, the kids, our kids, become more adult, and the millennials become, you know, start having more purchasing power and everything else, that you could see a huge explosion in volume for the letter carriers and for the USPS because of the nature of the way that our, our uh, retail experience is changing, right? And is that something that is <coughs> part, part of? But it's not just packages. I mean, with all of the, the technology, the internet, et cetera, what still works best is that interaction between the hard copy and the internet. I mean, you, what's the most cost-effective way of advertising? It is still in the mail. Um, you used to be able to, to have advertise on three channels on TV and, and hit 70, 80% of America. Now you may have to hit 70 or 80 channels to hit 3% of America because there's just so many channels out there. So advertising in the mail still makes a lot of sense. And you combine that knowledge with the technology the Postal Service has now with barcodes and scanning and tracking, the advertiser knows exactly when that advertisement hits your front door. And so the, the internet push that then can occur at the same time to get you to see it on the internet, see the hard copy together. All of those things working together can make everything more efficient, everything more effective. And so there's still a lot of work to be done to try and figure out how to make those two work together. Um, and I think it, it, it will result in more volume over time. In certain areas, it's going to continue to shrink, no doubt about it. 
but in other areas, new areas that we never thought about, I think there's growth opportunity if the structure is right to enable it to grow. So the last comment here, and we'll open it up, is that you know the, the whole big data revolution that's in politics, and it's something I've participated in, and, and, and Leanne's been a leading thinker about all this. It's interesting that now that you say this, right, that the only way <laughs> that the way that the Obama campaign, for example, using big data to target an individual voter was done through phone calls, mail, and door to door, right? There was no actual internet, I mean, it became much harder to do the internet push stuff out. Mm -hmm. So big data, the big data revolution required using old field techniques, stuff that George trained a lot of people about a long time ago, um, in order to realize the, the big data opportunity, right? The integration as we're, we're talking about it, because mm -hmm. the only way, you know, the Republicans is interesting, Rove, right, grew to power as a mail guy, right? He was a mail guy, not a TV guy, because he used databases back in the 70s and 80s to go one-to-one, to one to one, right? It was the one-to-one one revolution that began a long time ago. This big data stuff is not as big as everybody here says it is. Uh, this stuff really happened in the 70s and 80s to a great degree. But the, uh, it just happened in politics recently. That's part of what happened, but in our party, anyway. Um, but it's interesting that you talk about this, the need to marry, right? Because that's still, if you want to take advantage of the one-to-one, one, the, the digital side of that is, the digital push of that is still not so right. developed. Let's okay, let's open it up to the room. Uh, and we do have a mic uh, because people are watching on TV. And uh, anyone who'd like to go first, uh, raise your hand. We'll, and please identify yourself and ask away. Yes, sir. Uh, I've got three questions. Uh, <coughs> first of all, uh, Paul Marion from Queens, Chicago Business. Can you put into a nutshell exactly what you're proposing? Well, a lot of, a lot of um, what it would take to implement this public-private partnership can actually be done today under the current law that exists um, uh, governing the Postal Service. There are aspects of the law regarding some products and pricing that would have to be changed, and so the law would need to allow for those kind of changes to occur. The biggest thing is, though, um, making sure that there that the Postal Service would be free to move in this direction without being stopped at some point from some random piece of legislation that was attached to some other bill. So there has to be a, um, a sense um, in the country on the part of the Postal Service and the Congress that this should happen. So, and, and there are some slight changes to the law that would have to occur. But what we're really after is to get people to understand that what's being talked about today, um, the, the necessary changes that the Postal Service is looking for uh, in the law to enable them to, to stabilize their finances. All those things need to happen, uh, but it's not enough. And the other thing that needs to happen is to look at the structure uh, of the Postal Service uh, and who does what and to, to reinvigorate the, the, the growth engine of the mailing industry. And um, so we hope that as a result of this paper and our discussions, that it will get more serious looks on the part of the Postal Service, and that the Congress would be supportive of that kind of activity so that um, uh, plans could be developed, um, the necessary changes in the law to be uh, structured so that uh, uh, they're allowed to do this. Could John Uh, Amazon's a customer, so there's no, it's not a partnership. I mean, in a sense, it's a partnership because they agree to give it to the Postal Service so way, but they're a customer. What you're talking about <coughs> is um, that the Postal Service essentially um, gets out of the business of sorting mail, um, and uh, especially at origin. At destination, again, you can only have one provider, so they'd have to provide a structure that enabled bidders to bid on, on doing the work at that destination facility. But what you're doing is you're opening up the front end of the Postal Service to more providers to tailor the way that um, mail is entered into the system and moved to destination. And so while certainly the letter carriers would be involved in some collection of mail, you could have private companies that would be involved in collection of mail as, as well from customers. 
Um, and so the partnership, it, it's, it's, um, it's not a partnership in the sense that you and I have to write up a deal and shake hands and that's, it's the way that the Postal Service opens up that front end through its, its um, pricing, um, through its um, determination of what it's going to be in the business to do and what it's not going to be in the business to do. And basically the partnership is I, Postal Service, have decided I'm, I'm out of the business of, of to a certain extent, not completely, but to a certain extent of sorting the mail. That's going to be done by private industry and here's how it's going to be handled. So that's, that's really what we're talking about. How do the economics of this work? You're, you're basically saving money by doing this, or do you increase revenue stream? Or we, we believe that the cost of providing the service to for, for the products and services that the Postal Service and these uh, industry groups would handle uh, would be less, um, and um, it would also generate more revenue. So we think it would reduce the costs of postal operations significantly. Uh, Postal operation, not just, I didn't mean by that, you know, I shed half of my workload so my costs go down by half, but then private industry has the other half anyhow, so, you know, it's just one in one pocket out the other. Uh, we believe that the total cost of doing what the Postal Service does today could be less if there was a public-private partnership and it would lead to uh, increased volumes, which increase revenue. A little bit about how this makes sense in Montana or a rural area. What about a big city like Chicago? No, same, same thing. I mean, it's uh, doing that sorting, um, uh, bypassing operations, moving right to destination. It's, it's the same thing. Right now, um, the Postal Service has trouble trying to shut processing plants because there are congressmen who represent districts whose plant, uh, who, uh, in whose district the plant is located, and so they want to stop that from occurring. We'd like to see a kind of a situation where people begin to recognize this is a network and uh, political considerations uh, really can't come into play in a network. Some people have said what we need is, a, is like the base closing that the military did. Well, with all due respect, as complex as the military is, you can have a base in Connecticut or you can have a base in Pennsylvania and it doesn't make much difference. But if you have a plant in Connecticut, you can't say, well, let's have a plant in, P in Pennsylvania instead. You've got to be close to where your, your destination is. It's a network. And uh, the Postal Service, the industry, needs to be able to build that network uh, in a way that makes sense for the business that they've got and that they're going after. And that's constantly being hampered today and needs to stop. Okay. Hey, David, do you have a, anything you want to add? Yeah, go ahead. With all due respect to the great military closing closing process, because I worked on it for a time of it, um, it does make a difference when you close based on what they thought people used to when they built. So if you're talking about a mail and you're talking about processing plants, then if you get out of that component of supply chain, then you're not focused. That, that's certainly possible. I mean, yeah. the, the average age of a postal, well, you can talk to this. Well, it is possible, and that would be fine. <coughs> but, but the point is, we're not, you, if you see what's happening in the dynamic of the Postal Service now, people are leaving as they retire because the volume and the, and, and the market has changed. What we're suggesting is that you make the, make the system more effective and more relevant to what's going on today. And hopefully those jobs then, if it's a private company that's running that processing facility, I would hope that those were union, union jobs. I'm not suggesting that they be non-union jobs. 
Uh, and the fact of the matter is there's no reason they can't be. Uh, and, and when we went through this in 1970, as I said, some of the unions opposed collective bargaining legislation because they thought they were more secure under the civil service system. So, it, and then it transferred into, uh, into what it is now. So again, we're not advocating that these be non-union jobs. What we're saying is that people are, people are retiring and not being replaced. People, uh, jobs are being, are being uh, uh, lost because of, of the dynamics and the economics surrounding the Postal Service. So why not have a plan in place in which we save as many jobs as we possibly can we, we have a profit for the Postal Service, which will change the structure and the opportunity for jobs, and there's absolutely no reason that those jobs can't be union jobs. Questions, comments, Gary? Yes, sir. Perhaps I misunderstood you earlier on the rationale of, of uh, saving postal jobs by eliminating the hundreds of thousands of jobs in the distribution network. I don't quite understand how that works when you're cutting hundreds of thousands of jobs and how, it's how that represents a savings of jobs. The other issue that I have a question regarding is if the Postal Service was allowed to use its capitalistic uh, muscle, why would, why would private industry be opposed to that type of competition from a private company such as the Postal Service and let the Postal Service distribute this mail at a rate that's cheaper than what's done by pre-sort houses? Uh, well, the, the goal, the goal uh, we may have misspoken earlier, but the goal is not to save postal jobs. The, sa the goal is to grow the mailing industry in this country to be a, an economic engine. To the extent that those jobs are best done by postal workers, then that's, that's good. To the extent it's best done by something outside the Postal Service that can innovate faster than the Postal Service can, can tailor its, its offerings, then, then that's good too. Um, and we've seen that over and over again. Again, back in the, uh, in the 70s, uh, the Postal Service let loose of a lot of its processing to pre-sorters. And yet the mail volume grew, postal jobs grew, and, and that was good for, for everybody. Uh, it was a necessity back then. There's a necessity today to change. The fact is that private companies don't want the Postal Service with its sheer size to compete in areas where they have historically had uh, uh, complete control. No one, wants, no one wants the Postal Service to get into the Internet business. No one wants the Postal Service to get into warehousing. No one wants the Postal Service to own trucking companies. Um, that's, th there's, a, there's a sense in this country that this is what the Postal Service does, this is what they should do. And the other thing, frankly, is Postal Service isn't the experts in those industries. So if they were given the latitude to be able to get into warehousing, are they going to be the best warehouses in the country? No, because there's other companies that have been doing this for 200 years, and they know how to do it a whole lot better. Um, so it's, it's about finding the right organization to do the right things to grow the industry as a whole. And if you do that, there will be people tr uprooted, no doubt about it. Uh, and some of that uprooting will, when people look back on it, will be the greatest thing that ever happened to them, and some won't be as, as positive for sure. But the fact is that if you continue to do business the way you do today, jobs are going to go away, the mailing industry will fail, and you'll have major problems. Anything you want to add? I just wanted to point out the obvious, but, but should be stated. Again, UPS is, is union organized. The pilots for FedEx are union organized. There's an opportunity to organize people there too. And, and uh, I would advocate that, uh, that uh, employees of these processing plants be union and point out again that these jobs are starting to disappear and, and it's best to have a plan and to have a structure that will preserve jobs and promote the Postal Service than to allow things to go on the way they are and then have them scattered without any kind of, uh, without any kind of a plan. Yes, sir.
But it sounds to me what you're proposing is to privatize the non-delivery section of the postal service. And you talked about what this entity could do, John, what this entity could do other than delivery. I mean, the only way there can be an entity other than the postal service is that you privatize it and turn it over to somebody else. So can somebody meet me at that simplified level and say, this is what we're proposing to, to privatize the postal service other than delivery functions? For the most part, absolutely, we are talking about that. The only point that's different is uh, that final processing plant, the final sort to the carriers. That can't be wide open. That has to be, in a sense, contracted out to a company to do that. Or it could be the Postal Service uh, handling some of the plants. It, it may not be all of one or all of the other. There may be some areas where private industry isn't particularly interested in, in bidding on that, and it would be postal workers doing the same things that they're doing today. But what we'd be looking at is that the, the entry, the origin processing, would all be wide open and privatized. The destination processing at that final plant would be, in a sense, contracted out because you couldn't have multiple providers for an area. And that contracting out could wind up in it being a private company. It could wind up being postal service. Uh, so there's no absolute requirement that it has to be one or the other. It's, an, it's a transition process that would occur. Um, and uh, until you hit the right balance, uh, what made sense for the country uh, and for the industry as a whole for, and for customers. And you feel that it's what's happening now, and it's going to continue to happen based on the, the market and the economy, so we're trying to have a plan that will uh, retain the Postal Service's advantages and protect them um, with the best, and we only use them for the best of our ability. Yes, sir. Yeah, privatization is privatization. So what we're talking about here is really shifting jobs from decent paying middle class jobs to low wage jobs without any future to them, with no retirement benefits or little retirement benefits, probably no health care because that is, you talked about the direction the country is going in, that is the direction the country is going in. But what I find remarkable in this whole discussion and this was also on the uh, website, is the fact that we're not really talking about the fact that what's hurting the Postal Service is the incredible funding problem created by the U.S. Congress. The Postal Service would have made a profit in the last quarter were it not for the pre-funding of future retirees' health benefits. Right now, the Postal Service is, is funding retiree health benefits for people who haven't been born yet who may work in the Postal Service. So it seems to me that this is somewhat academic. I saw on the website, for example, the statement talks about the fact that the Postal Service wants a bailout. The Postal Service doesn't need a bailout. The Postal ne Service needs to be able to control its own, own finances. And if it can control its own finances, per what Mr. Nolan was saying, there are some great ideas that the Postal Service could do to expand its, its ability to bring in revenue from some of those very same uh, countries that Mr. Nolan was referencing. They're allowed to do all kinds of things that the Postal Service isn't allowed to do. But the Postal, you, you want the Postal Service to compete, let it compete. Get the Congress and those 535 micromanagers off the backs of the Postal Service and let the Postal Service start taking up different functions in order to bring in revenue. And just going back to where I started, Privatization is just a shift. It's not about costs, it's about wages. It's about overhead, and wages are the main part of the overhead that you're talking about. And I, I believe me, I'll do respect, George, we're talking about non-union, low-wage uh, low paying jobs. Well, that's an assumption on your part. I don't, number one, agree that they have to be low-wage uh, jobs. And secondly, historically, uh, there's always been a concern that the types of jobs will go in that direction. I'm not sure that that's going to be the case. And they're starting to go away anyway. Uh, and I agree with you, though, that uh, we need a comprehensive approach, that, uh, that the, the, the reference that you made to the, to the unnecessary payment that the Postal Service is making should be adjusted. There's no doubt about that. But even w after that happens, to suggest that then the Postal Service should be fine and doesn't need any other restructuring, I think, frankly, is a mistake. I think that's a short-term 
it, short-term solution, but not a long-term solution, for the postal service dealing with a world that's changing rapidly. And now is an opportunity to put together an idea that not only would, would allow the postal service to continue to do what it does best, but could protect the jobs that are still being retained instead of letting these jobs just float away as people retire and, and, and leave the service and then have less and less opportunity to protect the new jobs. Well, I don't think I have to explain that. But as far as our restructuring, part of our restructuring is bringing in new management. And that should be the cost center of the agency plan. And this was, uh, you know, if I'm a uh, wonderful employee at the beginning, you know, Amazon doesn't just suddenly show up at a rent payer door with package boxes and say, look, here it is, go deliver it. There is a going to it, there is a distribution component to this. So all these people that you guys mm -hmm. signed with RWC and that the American public has to see who are part of this network. Mm -hmm. And this network will be devastated by what you all propose. Well, again, obviously we disagree. I don't <laughs> think it'll be devastated. I think it's a plan. And I think what's going on now, there is no plan. And I think that's exactly what happened in 70. There was no plan. There was just people understandably trying to protect what they have because they're comfortable with it and they're secure with it and not venturing forth with any new ideas because that could be a problem. And I think the big problem will be if we don't have a plan recognizing that this change is inevitable. And can I, can I just add one thing is that so seven million workers in the, in the whole ecosystem, right? We've got eight. Eight million. Eight. And the biggest chunk of that outside the USPS is UPS in, in terms of one single company. Uh, it would be one, because I think UPS is bigger than FedEx, right, in terms yes. of em employment. So the single biggest chunk outside the USPS of that eight million is UPS, which is a unionized company. Yes. So part of what I would just say is that, you know, your scenario for the future could be true, right? An alternative scenario is that there's been a very successful unionization of the biggest single actor in the outside, in the, in the broader network. And, uh, and there would be total unionization of FedEx if the Congress hadn't interfered with Interfered, that. right. Okay, this is uh, two, more, two more questions. And this is, uh, we're a think tank. We want debate, discussion, heat, and light all at the same time. <laughs> Anything else, anybody? You got another? Uh, good question. But what would happen to post offices? Um, the retail entity um, um, has been changing over the last decades anyhow. You've got post offices in uh, retail stores. You've got uh, stamps sold in, in grocery stores. You've got separate kiosks. Um, and what we imagine uh, occurring over time is that there would continue to be a proliferation of uh, access points for mail, um, not only for businesses, but for individuals as well. Um, there may be less reliant, the notion of the importance that the Postal Service be the entity that, the, that uh, makes social life in, uh, in, in rural America possible um, by having a post office where everyone supposedly meets every morning uh, to discuss life as we know it um, is, you know, there'll still be post offices in small areas, but not all post offices, not all small areas should have a post office. And there may be better alternatives for that. But the Postal Service itself has been working with the uh, Postmasters Organization and, and its unions to look at ways to reduce the cost of providing that retail access uh, for Americans and has come up with some very interesting strategies in that regard that would enhance the, the touch points for Americans, but reduce the cost of providing those touch points significantly. And of, of, of necessity, in some cases, that would mean closing some offices, but it could also mean partnering with um, uh, greeting card stores, uh, retail, other retail shops, grocery stores, uh, to provide those uh, products, and along with uh, kiosks and um, uh, the internet, to provide those products and services. For, as an individual American, if, if we implemented, if it was implemented what we talked about, how would it change life for individual Americans? Essentially not at all, 
mail would be collected, mail would be delivered uh, by the Postal Service or collected by, uh, from a box by a private company. But to, to be as an individual American, I wouldn't really see any changes. Uh, maybe my stamp prices would, would be stabilized, although a penny every year isn't uh, uh, a huge increase, frankly. Um, uh, but as an individual American, I wouldn't see much difference. And uh, um, as a small business, uh, I would expect that over time that the right company is going to be handling my mail so I get the most efficient, effective way to, to do business with my customers. And sometimes that will be the Postal Service. Sometimes it's Amazon mailing through FedEx who gives it to the Postal Service to deliver on Sunday. <laughs> um, and uh, that's just the way it's, uh, it's going to work over time, I think. Yeah, last one. Uh, yeah, just use the use the mic if you could. Sorry. Yes. The private sector has been interested in taking portions of the postal service since the very beginning, and this is the beginning of that process. This is the private sector getting their hands on the profitable segments of the postal service for their own personal gain, and that's the problem I had before. No one's explained it. George knows his figure as well as I do because we've hated it ever since we first heard it. Eighty percent of postal service revenue goes to employees' compensation. And so when you're looking to save money, there's no place for the Postal Service to go except employee compensation. And George can wish it so. There's no way in the world they're going to replace postal employees with unionized, high-wage earning employees. They're going to go for the lowest wage employee they can get, provide less benefit. This is the beginning. If it were to be enacted, it would be the beginning of the end of the Postal Service and the beginning of the privatization of it. And I think it's a terrible idea. I've read it a number of times. It just doesn't make sense to me. Well, part of what we look at is there were 805,000 employees when I came back to the Postal Service in the year 2000. How many postal employees are there today? Without, without this proposal and being implemented, 520,000. And that's my concern, that that's going to continue and that we need a plan. And I'm open, obviously, to a better plan. But I don't see a plan. What I see is, understandably, human nature, and I do it myself, and that is to resist change, to hang on to what I have. And that's what I saw in 1970, and that's what I'm seeing now. And all I'm saying is that if you don't like the plan that we're suggesting, okay, come up with a plan. But don't just keep on saying, no change. I'm going to keep my job. No change. I'm going to keep my job. I don't think that's going to happen. And I think it's going to put you at a terrible disadvantage and give the leverage to the people that, yes, would prefer that everybody is in line. Last thoughts, gentlemen? Anything else? I All think right. I just made it. <laughs> <laughs> John, anything else? Uh, we appreciate the opportunity for to discuss this. Uh, there's a lot of work that would need to be done. Uh, I spent a lot of years with the Postal Service, and I love the Postal Service. Um, I think it's an important part of our economy. And uh, as George said, wouldn't be involved in anything that I didn't think over time was the right thing for the Postal Service because I think it's important to this country. And I guess my, my final comment, and, and, I, and I'm a newbie in this whole thing, and, and obviously there are, there are very tough choices ahead, is that it seems just on a, on a point of fact is that the Congress's inability to allow the, post the Postal Service to innovate and change based on historical circumstances created the opening for FedEx and to DHL and, and, and uh, or FedEx and UPS, let's just start with that. And in essence, that the inability for Congress to have a vision and a plan already privatized huge parts of what the post office, the Postal Service used to do. I mean, that's in essence what we're witnessing, right, is that a huge chunk of the movement of packages ara and, uh, around the country has already moved to private actors because of the understandable dysfunction of the way that Well, could I quickly yeah, yeah. add that? That's exactly right. What happened was the Postal Service actually had come up with the idea of, of a rapid package of rapid delivery internally within the Postal Service. And Fred Smith at, U at uh, FedEx came up with the, the, the same idea. And the Postal Service decided to give up its idea and defer and so all I'm again suggesting is have a plan. And if you've got a better plan, great, but have a plan to deal with the inevitable change that's coming about that affects the Postal Service and its employees and its 
and um, so thank you all for being here. Uh, you know, I, I've learned a lot through this process. I appreciate it. I think this is a really important issue. I think the passion we heard today is appropriate. Uh, this is one of the greatest institutions in the history of our country, founded, you know, the whole history of the founding of the Postal Service is really one of the great American stories. It really was, if you believe, and I didn't, I wrote about this more than I talked about it today, if you really believe there are these dynamic networks that undergird the prosperity of the American economy, the very first one was really the Postal Service, even really before the transportation network. I mean, even though it went over roads and so on, there was a lot of people who were getting, getting letters in those early days who didn't necessarily have a road that went to their house, right? And, and the way that we understand what a road is today. And so the transportation networks and the Postal Service in our country grew up together. And uh, so getting this right, given the historical import of this, even though we've now seen email and all the other things that have come on top and text messaging and all the other ways that we all communicate, I think uh, means that we gotta get it right. And, and I just appreciate uh, the spirit in which these two, you know, these team of four people have come about trying to tackle a tough subject, one that is 535 members of Congress have their own opinion uh, about this. I wish we could just use a buggy whip and get all those guys in line to do the right thing about you know, coming to an agreement about future products and services. I'm not an optimist about that, uh, personally, just having worked in, with Congress for 20 years. Uh, and let's have this debate. I mean, I think the point is, back there, is let's have this debate, right? Right now, the, I, I think the way the, post office, the Postal Service is heading is towards further erosion, further disaster, and there comes a point in any entity's life that if you keep losing, right, this, these things go out, a bit, you know, eventually they just go away. And I think what we want is a, a Postal Service that's winning, right? And I, and I think that's what we all want here together. And let's hopefully in the next few years, let's find a, a better path here than just continue pumping money into something that isn't working as well as we want. So thanks everybody for being here. I think our two authors will be around if you want to talk further. And uh, th this video will be online if anybody uh, has a friend who really wishes they were here. You can check it out. It'll be online later today. Thanks everybody for coming.